body was found, but it was real beat up. I remember that. Most of her head was gone. How in the hell did she get there? She walked 50 miles in her underwear in the middle of the night and throws them off the bridge. He had done a very good job of smashing and shattering those bones. I don't remember exactly, but probably the largest bone that was in there would be the size of one of your fingers. With that degree of burning, much of the bodies were destroyed. The bullets would have been consumed also in the fire. With the help of forensic science, most crimes can be solved. Forensic evidence is always there. It doesn't lie, it doesn't forget. But most criminals have never approached their crimes scientifically. If you were quite smart, I think it would be very easy to kill someone and get away with it. If you could make it look like an accident, authorities might not spot it as a murder. If you thought like a forensic scientist, could you commit the perfect murder? Is it possible to kill someone without leaving any marks at all on the body? And the answer to that has to be yes. It is possible. It was done in a very, very public place, and the perpetrator just got away with it. He disappeared. In cities across the world, people go missing every day. Some never turn up again. A few may even have been victims of a perfect murder. One which is unsolvable, where the criminal will never be caught. My favorite type of weapon, oh, that would have to be a knife. Poison. I would prefer uh, something unusual. Guns and daggers have served me very well for many years. Doug Lyle is a doctor who's developed an unusual sideline giving advice on how to kill people. He's 38 years old, he lives alone, mm -hmm. and he plays jazz. So how are we going to pull this off? How are we going to kill this guy? What's wrong with guns and knives? I will have writers, a room full of writers, say, okay, we are going to plot the perfect murder. We are going to kill someone, and we are going to try to do it perfectly. My idea would be some kind of undetectable poison that could be put on the saxophone mouthpiece or the reed. Doug travels the globe, helping authors come up with believable murder scenarios. As any physician will tell you, if they go to a cocktail party and they'll start asking you questions about their gallbladder or their prostate or their cholesterol or something. But if you go to writers' conferences, writers want to know how to kill people and get away with it. The times that I have seen a one-shot death are zero. To kill someone instantly, you have to be shot in the brain, in the heart, maybe. For many mystery writers, the idea of a perfect murder is the ultimate intellectual challenge. But a small number of people have tried to put theory into practice. Horrified officers found evidence that at least 10 people had been continuing to sift through the evidence. Drugged, killed and dismembered his victims. Lab reports came back positive for human remains. Forensic science has an impressive track record in catching murderers. Guilty to 15 counts of murder. Each new technology, from fingerprints to DNA, makes it harder for a criminal to get away with it. But is it possible to use a knowledge of forensic science not to catch a killer, but to commit a perfect murder? According to the experts, there might be a way to get away with murder. It would need an undetectable weapon, a perfect location to commit the crime, and an ingenious way to dispose of the body. When we're dealing with a homicide, of course, the body has to have been there for there to have been a homicide. So it is the biggest and the best source of all of the forensic science information, not just what's caused the death. 
The first interpretation of what the body has to say comes from the post-mortem. Dr. Richard Shepard has worked on cases from Stephen Lawrence to Jill Dando as one of the UK's top pathologists. The case he's looking at today is a bit unusual. This body is a model due to appear in the television program Silent Witness. The question we're often asked is, is it possible to kill someone without leaving any marks at all on the body? And the answer to that has to be yes, it, 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 can, it is possible to achieve that. The stimulation of this part of the neck on either side is very dangerous. At about this point, just below the ear, there's the main blood vessel, the carotid artery. Pressure on that point of the neck can cause the heart to stop suddenly. But generally speaking, injuries are caused because people go over the top. They apply far too much pressure and they do leave marks and they do leave injuries. The other thing to remember is that we can look in very special ways at bodies. Dissecting the neck, we may discover a little bit of bruising underneath the skin that isn't visible on the outside. A forensic pathologist isn't just concerned with how someone died. Other minor injuries are just as important in detecting a suspicious death. The dragging injury to the back of his foot, it's a deeply gouged injury, but it has these vertical lines. Someone has picked him up and dragged him and put him out of the way. The clues on this model body are plentiful, but even if none of these other injuries existed, Richard Shepard would still know the circumstances surrounding this death are suspicious. One of the things you can see on this body is, is this line of purpley red staining. Now this is not an injury. This is a change that occurs naturally after. It's called hypostasis and it causes the red blood cells just settle in the blood vessels under the influence of gravity. Because the blood pools in the areas of the body closest to the ground, the pattern of hypostasis gives a record of the position of the body at death. If I went to the crime scene and he was lying on his side with this pattern of hypostasis, that's not correct. Someone has moved him. So it gives us a very important clue. And it's one that, that a lot of people don't know. So if you're dumping a body, of course, you don't think, where's the hypostasis? You just dump the body and run. Spotting a suspicious death is a race against time. As a body begins to decompose, the information the pathologist relies on starts to disappear. In ancient Rome, they had a wonderful way of disposing of bodies. They threw them down sewers, so I'm very fond of throwing people down holes. The death body disposal is the simplest one, which is to leave the body in a wooded area that's not very well used. It also helps with the alibi because if you throw bodies down a hole, they stay there long enough so that you can't really find out what time they got murdered. Maybe the key to the perfect murder is simple. Leave the body somewhere, the clues will disappear before the authorities have a chance to examine it. Dr. Lee Goff has devoted his career to making sure that wherever a body is left, it won't allow a criminal to get away with murder. He's an expert in decomposition. When you look for something that's going to be a model for human decomposition, you want to find something that's very similar in metabolism to the human. You also want something that if somebody happens to encounter it, while they're out hiking around, they're not going to get really upset. 50-pound domestic pig seemed to work beautifully. Ah, there's a face. <laughs> Lee uses dead pigs to recreate murder scenes to help the police solve criminal cases. He monitors the corpses daily to measure the rate of decomposition in these different situations. Well, what we're going to is a uh, pig that uh, is being used to replicate a homicide where the body was wrapped. Everybody ready for that? Yeah. 
Grand unveiling. No matter how well hidden, flies will very rapidly pick up on the smell of a dead body. What's going to happen with the wrapping is it's going to delay the access of a lot of the insects to the pig. Insects are some of your earliest arrivals at a crime scene, and as such, they provide you with a great deal of information if you can interpret it properly. You get, a, get a few out of the ear. Okay, now these are pretty smooth, so it looks pretty much like these are all going to be the Chrysomyia megacephala. Day or night, 10 minutes following death, that species is going to show up. Lee collects insects from crime scenes because these tiny maggots can do something even the UK's top pathologists can't. When did it happen? The time of death poses us with some very, very significant problems. If you don't know when someone was killed, you can't prove a suspect was there at the time of the murder. The best a pathologist can do is a spread of five and a half hours and that's based on the body temperature. And that really only applies, though, in the first 24 hours after death. If a body's been dead longer than that, then that spread gets bigger and bigger and bigger. After just a few days, the pathologist can no longer pinpoint the time of death. But insects have such regular life cycles, from maggot to pupae to fully grown fly, they can keep on marking time accurately for months or even years. by going to the body, collecting the most mature specimens that are there, we can then work backwards and determine when the insect eggs were laid. And this will correspond, most of the time, very closely to our minimum period of time since death. Lee's insect evidence has provided the crucial time of death in murder convictions right across the US. Basically, this is my office. A few things here that are probably you don't find in most offices. Uh, uh, manual on how to deal with child abduction serial killing is not probably normal. <laughs> this is an insect killing jar. Uh, these are specimens that were recovered actually from a case down in Tennessee. Calculating the time of death is a complicated business. <laughs> What happens is you have, for each stage, a minimum period of time that it's going to take to complete development. And this will correspond to the time... At any given crime scene, there are hundreds of variables. And as we sum these up, actually working backwards, and by adding each of the degree hours for each... Temperature, stage, weather, species of insect, all of these must be taken into account to obtain an accurate time of death. We simply sum these up. Lee's ability to interpret what the insects have to say has made him invaluable to the police for the past 20 years. Then we began to come up with the actual time frame. Uh, this was a relatively simple one. No murder scenario has yet stumped Lee and his insects. Even when criminals have deliberately tried to tamper with the evidence, Lee can rely on his pig experiments to help him work out what's happened. One particular case that comes to mind is a, an instance where the body was doused with insecticide. When we figured out it, the insecticide was present, we conducted experiments to see what happened, and then all of a sudden everything fell into place. Lee thinks it would be virtually impossible to commit a perfect murder by altering the insect evidence. There are so many things that would have to be taken care of. Even an entomologist will make mistakes in that particular instance. With the entomologist deciphering the insect evidence and the pathologist interpreting what the body has to say, getting away with murder would be very difficult. But some criminals have managed to leave the body somewhere. There were no clues for these experts to find. Almost a perfect murder. This is Bowman's Bay where the body was found. I believe it was April 27, 1990. The 
case was assigned to prosecuting attorney Mike Rickard. I was first notified of it when Frank Kendall, our coroner, called. He thought it was a suicide and it, it, it floated out into Bowman's Bay and got hit by a tanker or something, which is why it was all torn up, so it was pretty torn up. Most of her head was gone. Suicides are not uncommon in the Seattle estuary, but Mike Rickard was not convinced. She was wearing just a sweatshirt and a pair of panties, no shoes. Well, she lived 50 miles from here. And if the person's gonna commit suicide, you know, they normally, we've had a lot of them, they park on the bridge, and over they go, they leave a note or something. She didn't have a car or anything. How'd she get, I said, Frank, how in the hell did she get there? Did she walk 50 miles in her underwear in the middle of the night and throw herself off the bridge? I don't think so. Rickard had a hunch the husband had something to hide. He says, well, we had dinner last night, and then she just left. She walked out the door and we never saw her again. This was well after midnight, we thought, well, that's bullshit. But with no scientific evidence to disprove the husband's story, there was no case. Years before Ricketts' investigation, Ridley Pearson had planned a very similar murder for a crime novel he was writing. I want it to be just as difficult as it can be for the investigator. It was going to be a forensics exploration into where this body started and if they could find where it started, was there ever any evidence there that could eventually connect to a suspect? Ridley's fictional detective needed the help of an expert on tides and currents. Hey. So he tracked one down in real life. So here we are. Yep, there's the model. That's enormous. Professor Alan Duxbury's working model of the Seattle estuary could recreate the tides at any time in the past, present, or future. Now, where's the Pacific Ocean? The ocean is a saltwater tank. There is a tidal box in here that goes up and down, driven by a computer, and it produces the rise and fall of water in the model. Ridley wanted to know where his fictional murderer could have dumped the body for it to wash up where it did. My original plan was that perhaps the body had gone in north of the city of Seattle, up in here. somewhere up in here, um, and then it ended up at Alki Point. And uh, Dr. Duxbury said, no, 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 no. It's just not the way it works. Duxbury could not have known that his work on this detective story would one day help solve a real life crime. Look at that. It's perfect. Bullseye. Don't you love science? <laughs> I knew that uh, obviously the tidal currents had to carry the body. And I had read a book a year or two before. It was a crime novel that uh, spoke of a oceanography tide table that could recreate our tides in Puget Sound. I thought, well, that was curious. Maybe th this technology could help us. And we called Alan Duxbury and asked him if he could help us. Duxbury's tidal currents suggested Rickard's victim might have fallen from Deception Pass Bridge a mile away. The bridge is about 180 feet high, I believe. It's quite a drop. Well, right below the bridge in these rocks was where the investigators found bits and pieces of the victim's brain and some blood evidence and all. So it was fairly obvious that she'd come off the bridge and landed in this spot and laid there on the rocks. Her husband claimed she'd committed suicide after leaving his house well past midnight. So Rickett needed to know the exact time the woman had come off the bridge. To an oceanographer, the solution was obvious. The body had actually landed on some rocks, so I got them to go back to the site and establish what was the elevation relative to sea level. And knowing that, we could then find out what time during that day would the level rise high enough to essentially have encompassed a body and, say, lifted it off or floated it off the rocks. Professor Duxbury, uh, through his calculations, was able to tell us that she came off the bridge somewhere between 9.30 and 11 o'clock in, in the evening. 
Rickard finally had scientific proof that the husband was lying. He'd solved what could have been a perfect murder. There was no eyewitnesses. There was no confession. He was adamant that he last saw her late after midnight, and uh, the case totally turned on the, the forensic evidence. He never did admit it. But the jury didn't have much trouble convicting him. Wherever a body is dumped, there will be a branch of science that can help catch the criminal. Meteorologists, seed and pollen experts, fire investigators. There'll always be someone who can work out what happened. That's why many murderers go one step further and attempt to destroy the body altogether. DNA expert Eleanor Graham has been using pig strutters to see what evidence different methods of body disposal might leave behind. There's been many, many cases of dismembered bodies. It happens all the time. People don't generally skin them, like, but you do get a lot of dismembered corpses. So what I'm trying to do here is go straight through the knuckles. If you're actually trying to take something apart, the easiest way to go through is through the soft tissue, obviously avoiding the bones. As you can see from this, it's particularly hard to do. It's not an easy thing to do. Dismemberment alone can make life difficult for investigators. But some murderers have gone one step further to ensure the body can't reveal any secrets. A disused builder's yard is under police guard as local police and home office officials search through debris. In the 1940s, acid baths were used by John Hay to dissolve the bodies of six victims. As you can see, almost instantly the corrosive effect is taking place. The tissue is starting to be destroyed already. This kind of process is exactly the same as um, what would happen for a human body. It's a very, very dangerous and corrosive chemical. So this is one that's been in the bath for seven days. Acid can completely destroy organic material, it will destroy all DNA evidence, but this is still incredibly dangerous. I mean, a lot of it is still acid, which is still quite difficult to get rid of. That's what makes it such a dangerous uh, method of disposal, a bit crazy if you ask me. It would take around 27 gallons of sulfuric acid and several weeks to dissolve a whole body. And it's not even foolproof. Acids can't actually digest fat, so that fatty material will still remain. In the fatty sludge dragged out of Hayes' workshop, they found an intact pair of dentures, a red plastic handbag, and three human gallstones. Gallstones are covered in a fatty material, makes them quite resistant to acid digestion. Getting hold of enough sulfuric acid to dissolve a whole body is virtually impossible. But forensic scientists are well aware of other less dangerous methods. This is just normal biological washing powder, the same as what you would use at home. So now we just need to add some water. This uses the biological enzyme's ability to break down proteins and fats, to get rid of tissue and fatty material. After seven days at 60 degrees, the powder has taken effect. And as you can see, there's not much meat left at all, and what there is left, you can literally just push off with your fingertips. So basically, we have been left with mostly just the bones. It's been cleaned up pretty nicely. Destroying all the soft tissue to leave only bones would make a murder far more difficult to investigate. Could this be the key to the perfect murder? today confessed to killing as many as 14 people. Detectives describe it as a year-long orgy of death, dismemberment and cannibalism. Through the night, forensic teams removed a fridge containing human skulls 
boxes holding parts of other bodies and three torsos from a barrel found in a bedroom. All that was left of some of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims were bones. The remains of one victim were taken to forensic anthropologist, Dr. Robert Mann, for analysis. The medical examiner brought a few boxes of bones, and they had bags in them. And as we open the bags, we see there's just pieces of bones in there. There's shards of bones. I don't remember exactly, but probably the largest bone that was in there would be the size of one of your fingers, maybe a little bit bigger. Jeffrey Dahmer had dismembered his victims and stripped their bodies to skeletons. He would take a skull, he would clean it up with acid, and he did a, a very professional job. And then he destroyed the skeletons by smashing it up with a sledgehammer. And then once he threw it in the backyard, he was going to let Mother Nature actually destroy it further because acid soils and roots will destroy bones and teeth. If convicted, you're facing 15 terms of life imprisonment or a total of 150 years. Do you understand all of that? Yes, I do, Your Honor. The bones brought to Bob Mann and his colleagues at the Smithsonian were believed to be that of Dharma's first victim. But without an identification, there might be no murder charge to answer. That was a very difficult case because he did such a good job of trying to destroy the body. He made it very difficult for us. But what he didn't know is forensic science can undo what he did. It took us about a month. We put everything that we could back together again, and we were able to identify the victim by one bone from his neck. And we compared it to an x-ray of Stephen Hicks when he went to the dentist when he was 13 and a half years old. And we were able to see that that vertebra in his neck matched young Stephen Hicks. And the identification was done. Bob's evidence helped to convict one of the world's most frightening serial killers. Jeffrey Dahmer was found guilty of 17 counts of murder. And he was put away for the rest of his life. And I think it was in 1994 that he was beaten to death in prison. And that ended the life uh, and the tale of Jeffrey Dahmer. Despite his crime-solving expertise, Bob Mann doesn't work for Scotland Yard or the FBI, but the US military. He leads the world's biggest team of forensic anthropologists at the US military's Central Identification Lab in Hawaii. The main aim of Bob's team is to put names to hundreds of skeletons of soldiers killed in conflicts from World War II to the present day. I think many people would be surprised to know how many forensic anthropology techniques have been pioneered over the years since the 1940s that follow on the heels of a war. The cranium is completely fractured. You kind of have to do some reconstruction to see it. But... The original work in determining the age of victims from their skeletons was done on the remains of US soldiers from the Korean War. Today, they use dental records, DNA, and photographic imaging techniques. And just from these bones, the team can also work out how someone died. On the right side of the skull, we have a small hole that is internally beveled. That is, the bone is broken away on the inside of the skull. This suggests that a projectile entered the skull here and came out on the other side. You can see that the left arm is pretty intact. The right upper arm is largely missing. There are several fragments, and one of them has a, a fragment of oxidized metal embedded in it. And so this is what we would see with trauma consistent with a blast. If we postulate that the individual's head was slightly turned to the right, all four of those trajectories are approximately parallel, suggesting that the individual may have been shot multiple times while in the same position by the same shooter. The team have a huge database of injuries caused by different weapons. Gunshot and grenade injuries are some of the easier ones to spot. But is there a weapon that wouldn't be detected by these bone experts? Yeah. 
There are two types of trauma that we commonly deal with. The blunt force trauma usually is pretty easy to, to discern. You can see that when somebody gets hit with a baseball bat or something, the bones break in large pieces. When you're talking about knife force trauma, that's something that can be much more difficult to determine. This is normal. All of this is normal architecture, but when we get very close to it, what's different is there's two little holes right here. Once a forensic anthropologist has found the marks, they can work out the type of weapon that caused them. When you look at it really from the end going down, you can tell that that's a triangle, and it fits very nicely right into the bone. And sometimes the marks on the bones can identify not just the type of weapon, but the actual one used to commit a murder. There are tool marks that would be exhibited on the tip of this. If you notice, it's just bent up a little bit into one corner. When it hit, it may have nicked the bone and might be able to match it up. A bullet could be linked to a gun, a knife wound to a knife. The weapon a murderer uses could easily give him away. But there is a weapon, used in fiction, which could never be linked to a crime. Any weapon that self-destructs is probably the greatest weapon, like an icicle. It's such a cliche, everyone's used it, has been done in the past, and it really wouldn't work, it wouldn't work well at all. It's just a bad weapon of choice. The icicle as a murder weapon is an urban legend, it's not possible. I cannot imagine a murderer would really want to spend an awful lot of time hanging around a fridge. An icicle would disappear before an investigator could link it to the injuries on a body. But could it actually kill someone? The only way to find out is to get two of the world's leading forensic scientists to test it. This is unique for us because we're going to try to see if an icicle will penetrate meat and if it will do any damage to a bone at all. A local ice sculptor has supplied the weapons. I've got my reservations about whether or not this is actually going to work. I think this can be fairly fragile. Three, two, one, go. That hurt. Yep. Lift it up, I bet it point awesome. may have gone all the way through. Yeah, right there. That went all the way through. And that's about what five, about five inches deep. And would have kept going if it hadn't hit the uh, hit the bottom. Okay, I don't think it's going to go through this part with the rib slab. Did it hit the bone? Hit the bone, but it went through. There's the ice. Yeah, it went yeah. all the way through it. I'm really surprised. Yeah. That's fairly effective. Nice one. It could kill you. Yeah. Sure could. But in the right place. And that's pretty amazing, though. It does work. An icicle, properly made, might be a potentially lethal weapon. It would conveniently disappear after use and probably wouldn't leave any marks on the bone. However, I see a few logistical problems in terms, uh, especially here in Hawaii, of <laughs> getting the icicle out to the victim. If you're wandering around with an ice chest full of these, you might arouse a certain amount of suspicion. Even armed with an undetectable weapon like an icicle, any criminal would be leaving other clues behind. Trace evidence is the latest development in the forensic armory. The CSI team can pick up fingerprints, fibers of clothing, even footprints on a dusty carpet which is why some criminals have tried to alter the crime scene to defeat the investigators. This small town in Ohio was the scene of a brutal double homicide. It was Christmas 2005 when a 70-year-old grandmother and her daughter were killed in this house. The man who committed the crime thought he could defeat forensic science, leaving absolutely nothing behind that could link him to the scene. He very nearly got away with murder. The case was brought to trial by the county prosecuting attorney, Dennis Watkins. He was an intelligent young man. He enjoyed watching the Discovery Channel, and he particularly liked CSI. He's interested in learning ways to defeat the law. He knew about trace evidence and that DNA could be found. 
Jermaine McKinney tried to apply what he'd learned from television to the murder scene. We have a criminal that has a cold-blooded plan to get away with a double homicide. Very thorough, very planned, very premeditated in his methodology. He dragged both victims a total of 44 feet to the furnace room. And he set the victims on fire along with clothing and much of the bodies were destroyed. With that degree of burning, the bullets would have been consumed also in the fire. No fingerprints were found. And then afterwards, he washed the car at least twice. The car was clean. We didn't get any evidence from that car. So he's thinking about destroying any trace evidence. There was one last thing that might link Jermaine McKinney to the murders. The blood-stained boots he'd been wearing. He drove over 20 miles to a remote lake to dispose of them. It was at night. It's near midnight. It's dark. Well, he's taken out of the car the boots, and he goes to the bridge and he throws them over. McKinney drove away, but hidden under the bridge, the lake was frozen, just enough to keep the boots afloat. It was only around the edges and underneath the bridge that you had a thin layer of ice. It was a miracle that those boots stayed on the surface because the ice was melting. If it would have been a day later, the boots surely would have gone to the bottom. By chance, a passerby spotted them and notified the police. The blood of both victims was on the outside of the boots. Inside was McKinney's DNA. We have his DNA, 813 million to one, it's him. There's only 300 million people in the United States of America. That piece of evidence is great. The defense didn't call a single witness. Jermaine McKinney was sentenced to life imprisonment. He very nearly got away with murder, but for a pair of boots and the weather. No matter how smart you are, things happen. Many of the homicides I've prosecuted over the years, it's almost like a God's doing something. And that's how we get these killers, because not only do they make mistakes, we have a little bit of luck. It's just not meant to be. They're not meant to get away with it. No matter how well planned a crime, eliminating every clue is virtually impossible. Basically, every single cell in our bodies, except red blood cells, actually contain DNA. So all the time we're walking around, we're shedding DNA. We see it as dust, see it as a bit of spit. Everything like that does contain DNA. I can recover that and get someone's profile from it. You don't even need to touch anything to leave your DNA behind. When I speak, I can't help projecting saliva, which contains DNA from my cheek cells. A few tiny cheek cells is enough for DNA expert Eleanor Graham to extract a unique genetic fingerprint. If we look at sheet C, you can actually see the coloured spikes, which are the DNA, and this DNA actually matches 100% to our suspect. This gives us a match probability, conservatively estimated at one in a billion chance that it was her and not somebody else. It's practically impossible to commit a crime without leaving your DNA everywhere you go. Even speaking for less than 30 seconds, my DNA will still be picked up. But there is one situation that might confuse even an expert like Alana. The situations where you might have more than three or four people contributing to a DNA profile would be very difficult for me to interpret. 
DNA and other trace evidence will disappear when mixed with samples left by hundreds of other people. So the cleverest murderers plan to commit the crime in a public place. It's been called an unprecedented event in Somebody the wanted him dead. The whole deficiency of this killing is poisoned, but by what? Could something have been placed in the sushi he ate? Litvininko. So the story about Litvininko, he went to a hospital in Barnet and they thought he had a gastroenteritis. The hospital, there's been confusion and uncertainty over what... Experts first thought it was thallium poisoning. Now they're not so sure. He'd been poisoned with a radioactive substance. Murder by radiation. Polonium-210. Toxicologist Professor John Henry was consulted by Litvinenko's family. There has never been a case of polonium poisoning that we know of before. So the assassins were into a novel type of territory. It's a very, very insidious and uncontrollable sequence. Liver damage, heart failure. Once he had been poisoned, there was nothing that we could do, nothing that anybody could have done, even if they'd known. Because polonium had never been used before, the symptoms confused the investigators. They had suspected radiation, they thought of it, and yet their test said no radiation. It was not picked up with standard tests, because polonium gives out alpha particles. Alpha particles will not pass through the skin. So you can put a Geiger counter over somebody, you can scan them, and you'll say, well, there's nothing coming out here. They went for the more sophisticated and subtle approach. Should also give time for the killer it's to like get away. The bad old days of the Cold War. And Alexander Litvinenko has died. Oh, poison. An unusual type of poison is a trick many assassins have relied on. Do they try to give him something to drink or force it down his throat? While the experts try to work out what has happened, the poisoner has plenty of time to escape. Litvinenko is the most recent case in a long series of mysterious and murky poisonings. Yorgai Markov, a Bulgarian dissident. Markov was stabbed with a poisoned umbrella on Waterloo Bridge in 1978. The only poison could have been ricin. His killer was never caught. Another case I'd like to tell you about is Yushchenko. In 2004, Ukrainian presidential candidate Viktor Yushchenko developed strange spots on his face. For weeks, doctors believed it was a result of something he ate. Those spots, well, looked like acne, but nobody put the whole story together to make a diagnosis. So I said it has to be dioxin, which was used as a defoliant, um, Agent Orange, it's regarded as pretty toxic. Yashenko was fortunate to survive. His poisoning was nearly dismissed as a simple illness. If you can produce uh, a mystery illness and nobody thinks of looking for the poison, well then, uh, the poisoner has won. You have uh, managed to assassinate somebody, they've got no bullets inside them, they don't leave fingerprints, nothing is seen, nothing is known, and they get away with it. It's pretty scary. Investigators would now recognize the signs of ricin, dioxin, or polonium poisoning very quickly. But a more obscure poison might be dismissed as a mystery illness, or even a natural death. If one could be found, it could be used in a perfect murder. So how are we going to pull this up? How are we going to kill this? The guy? perfect murder would have to combine all these elements. A poison that appeared to be a mystery illness. A location where trace evidence would go unnoticed. There's blood everywhere in sure. the uh, mortuary. Yeah, the morgue is a place to kill someone. Yeah. And a way to dispose of the body completely. Stick his body in the, somebody else's coffin, and send that to the crematorium. <gasps> yeah, right. so it yeah. might just be possible, but the odds favor the police. The murderer need only make one mistake, 
and the forensic scientists will be on his trail. Even the authors admit it's unlikely to work outside of a book. The perfect murder is possible in fiction because I make all that stuff up. I don't think it's possible in real life. There's always a clue left behind if it's, a, if it's even just a spoken word. A killer always leaves a calling card, always. Things just go wrong. I don't care how well you plan them, they go wrong. There's no such thing as a perfect murder. But there is a real life murderer who did all the right things for a perfect crime. He used poisons and many of his victims were cremated. Most importantly, no one even realized these people had been murdered. It's much more common for older people to die as a result of natural causes. And if there's a doctor who says, oh, I've, I've known Mrs. Mrs. Bloggs for 15 years, I know what's exactly why she's died, and I was expecting it to happen any day, and I'll sign a death certificate, then the investigative side can be bypassed completely. This murderer was sure the death certificate would be signed without an inquiry, because the murderer was the victim's GP. The case of Harold Shipman is a very interesting one. He was trusted, he had access to people, he could inject poisons into them, and the poison he chose was morphine, a very, very ordinary pain-killing drug. It was as easy as that. Cold-blooded perversion of medical skills biggest serial killer in British criminal history. An excess of 91 deaths. Some speculate it's more than a thousand. The police said Shipman covered his tracks by falsifying death certificates and callously misleading relatives. For years, Shipman was never properly investigated because the murders were completely motiveless. The Shipman case turned into one of Britain's biggest murder investigations, but it started only when the daughter of one of his victims realized that her mother's will had been forged. It said, I want to reward him for all the care he's given to me and the people of Hyde. The perfect murder is an interesting concept because, of course, Harold Shipman performed several hundred perfect murders, one would say that there was only one case that wasn't the perfect murder. Once you'd understood that first one, then suddenly you had another six, and another six, and another 50, and another 100. And there's a whole series of cases that were investigated that there was never any suspicion that he may have been involved. So yes, they were in the bracket of the perfect murder, eventually found out, but it was a long time before anyone twigged. Harold Shipman left his trial showing no remorse and offering no clue as to why he became a mass killer. A prosecution lawyer said it was simply because he enjoyed it. Like Shipman, many serial killers might not have been caught if they'd only killed one victim with no obvious motive. So the perfect murder is possible in real life. But the killer cannot make a single mistake with even the tiniest piece of evidence. And the forensic scientists only have to get lucky once. There may well be a perfect murder, and there may have been perfect murders where people have got away with it. We don't know. <laughs>